Hi. Thank you so much for being here. I, am, I think you're all very brave in this weather. I said I think I would be home with a cup of tea or something. So, um, And thank you so much for having me, Gwen. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, as Gwen mentioned, I've been in New York, in DC, in San Francisco, and this is my uh, first stop in the middle, so to speak. Um, so thank you for being here with me. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the genesis of this book, and then I thought I would read a bit. Um, go over some of the major themes of the book, and then we'll open it up to Q&A and we can have a discussion. So I started reporting C. Jane Wynn. It was initially called C. Jane Run when I pitched it to publishers. So this was back in February 2017. And it was clear to me at that time that the public temperature had changed. Uh, certainly, the political discourse in our country has heightened a lot, uh, to say the least in the past few years and a bit leading up to that as well. Um, it was clear after the 2016 elections that for millions of Americans, uh, particularly American women, it had struck a nerve. Um, and we saw immediately after uh, that November 2016 election day, groups like the ACLU and Planned Parenthood were getting flooded with uh, donations uh, from women across this country. And then, of course, in January 2017, there was the Women's March, where in 60 countries around the world, including in Antarctica, which I found quite remarkable, um, women and male allies uh, took to the streets um, in what is one of the largest public demonstrations in history. And so at that time, the question that I was sort of left with, well, what is going to be the lasting change? What is sort of the bigger impact of this movement, and where do we go from here? And there were early reports then that groups like Emerge America and Emily's List and Vote Run Lead, that they were being similarly inundated, this time with women who were newly interested in running for office. So women who had never run before, who didn't perhaps have that traditional political resume, who all of a sudden felt a sense of urgency. And they said, how do I get involved in this? How do I do it? And I mean a huge percent increase. So for example, in a typical year, uh, a group like Emerge might have 900 applicants, and all of a sudden there were over 14,000. So it was a very significant jump. So around that time, I started calling various groups and saying, well, can I get on the phone with some of these women? Who are they? What's motivating them? I really want to hear from them. So I started having these early conversations. And I would get off the phone, and sometimes it would be a five minute phone call. I'd say, oh, can I have five or 10 minutes of your time? You know, I promise not to bother you too much. I just kind of want to hear your story. And an hour or two later, I'd get off the phone, and I would find myself feeling really energized. And I thought, there's something here. And I didn't know then how many of those women would actually run. I didn't know who would make it past their primary, much less win in a general election. But I felt that there was something happening, and I thought, what is it to campaign while female in the current environment that we're in? And how can women perhaps, if they do end up running in record numbers, much less winning in record numbers, which now we know that they did, how can they change a system that by and large has been designed by men for men? And so that was where this whole thing started. And it actually enabled me to get in on the ground level. I followed a group of diverse women running for both state uh, and federal offices throughout the course of their entire campaigns. And then with that, of course, there were other things that ended up happening in the background. So there was the continuation of movements such as Black Lives Matter, but there was also the Me Too movement, which exploded uh, in the fall of 2017. Um, there was the Ford Kavanaugh hearing, which happened uh, very shortly before the election. And these very, uh, and of course, there were also uh, March for Our Lives. So young people in this country mobilizing around gun legislation. And so with those different movements happening in the background as well, uh, it really was a chasing sort of a moving target and a moving uh, story throughout this entire process. And just like all of you, I didn't know until election night if I was telling an inspiring story of women winning and getting into these seats, um, or if it was going to be a story about what went wrong and a struggle and uh, where we go from here. Needless to say, in November 2018, as we now know, uh, there was a record number of women in Congress now. We have more women in Congress than ever before. Uh, we have more women in our state legislatures than ever before. And we also have our first female majority state legislature in Nevada. So first time in history 
Um, and those women have, in one legislative session, and I'm probably going to miss some things, um, in one legislative session, they passed uh, a law to help with the state's backlog of rape kits. They got rid of an antiquated abortion law that required providers to ask women their marital status before, before performing a procedure. Um, they put in better protections for sexual assault survivors. They raised the minimum wage, uh, which the majority of minimum wage workers in this country are women, and that's just a sampling of what they were able to do in three short months. So, the book ended up being called See Jane Win. Um, I'm going to read a bit of it now, so just to sort of take you into uh, this piece of the book. This was on election night. One of the women I followed was now Congresswoman Abigail Spamberger. So Abigail is from Virginia. She represents a district uh, that's right outside the Richmond area, largely suburban, although there's some farmland there as well. It had never been represented by a woman, ever, and it had, been represented, uh, it had not been represented by a Democrat since 1968. She was running against a Republican incumbent by the name of Dave Bratt. Uh, Dave Bratt was an ardent Trump supporter. He ran largely on a anti-immigration campaign when he ousted uh, Eric Cantor in 2014. And this race, to me, symbolized kind of a larger scale thing that was happening across the country, where you had a first-time female candidate who had never run for office before taking on a white male incumbent um, in what had been a historically Republican enclave. And it really kind of set up um, this battle, I guess, that was intriguing from a storytelling perspective. But there was also the fact that Abigail Spamberger represents what has actually traditionally been a really hard demographic to get to run for office, which is women who are mid-career with young children. So Abigail is a former CIA operative. Uh, she worked in, I, I met her, she was 37 years old, had never run for office before, mother of three. So when she uh, announced her candidacy, her youngest daughter was three years old and her oldest daughter was nine. Um, so she certainly fit into uh, that hard to get demo. Um, and at this point, I followed her even before she decided to officially run. So I was really able to be with Abigail throughout her entire journey. And this all brought us to election night uh, where I was in her hotel room with her and her speechwriter, Max Hayworth, who you're going to hear about uh, in, in this chapter. And it was the three of us at a time just sort of sitting in this hotel suite watching the results come in with a huge crowd downstairs. Uh, and it was a very, very close race. So that's kind of where we're coming in now. Okay, bear with me a little bit here. I'm gonna just move this. Everyone can hear me okay? Okay, great. If it's starting to go bad, Adam, you need to be the one to tell me, Spamberger said from the bedroom of a suite at the Westin in Richmond. Leaning back in a, quarter, in a corner lounge chair, clutching a throw pillow in one hand and her phone in the other, she locked eyes with her husband. It was after 9 p.m., and while almost all the polls in Virginia's 7th District had been closed for two hours, the predictably competitive race against Republican incumbent Dave Bratt was still too close to call. An hour earlier, Spamberger had laughed with her mom in the hallway outside her suite saying, I'm so calm I could fall asleep. Now she pulled at her sheer stockings and tucked her hair, freshly blown out, camera ready, behind her ear. Even such subtle signs of nervousness were rare for the former CIA operative who'd been trained to keep her cool. The mood had shifted when Spamberger learned that Amy McGrath, the Marine fighter pilot running for Congress in Kentucky, lost her race. Spamberger and McGrath had supported each other throughout their campaigns and developed a friendship. Both women had served their country, McGrath in the military, Spamberger in the CIA. They were both mothers, and they were both first-time candidates running as Democrats in Republican-held districts. See, this worries me, said Spamberger, reading more into, about McGrath's loss on her phone. She glanced up at Adam. How did the numbers look? Very close, said Adam, in a gray suit with an Abigail Spamberger for Congress button pinned to the lapel. I'm very nervous now that Amy didn't win, she said. Adam returned to the living room where a team member was hunched over a laptop covered in campaign stickers, waiting for more polling locations to report results. Spamberger inhaled sharply. A month earlier, she told me she hadn't even considered the possibility of losing, said, that's what she said, even, uh, even though the 7th District uh, hadn't elected a Democrat since 1968, more than a decade before Spamberger was born. But this was also the first time the election was out of her hands. 
For 16 months, there had always been more to do. Another phone call, another fundraiser, another meet and greet or email. With no items left to check off, she appeared antsy, scrolling through Twitter and spinning her foot round and round in a pair of practical black wedges until her ankle cracked like a knuckle. Suddenly, the sound of people yelling in the next room pierced through the walls. Spamberger jolted up. Why are they cheering, she said. Bettina Weiss, her camp deputy campaign manager, sat on the king bed next to her. The TV in the bedroom was off, and Weiss pulled up her phone. I'm not seeing anything, she replied. It was a false alarm, a knee-jerk reaction from excited campaign workers watching election updates on CNN. The New York Times election ticker had flipped from Spamberger to Brad and back multiple times, and everyone was understandably on edge. When a blonde candidate flashed on the television with a big check next to her face, the indicator that the race had been called, they'd briefly mistaken it for Spamberger. Don't they know not to do that, Spamberger said, half smiling. She slathered some cheese from a plastic tub onto a cracker and glanced back down at her phone. A photo of Brat's campaign party appeared on her feed, a few lonely tables surrounded by red upholstered chairs in a mostly empty ballroom. Look at this, she said, flashing the screen at her speechwriter and friend Max Hayworth, who was hammering out the last tweaks to the victory speech he hoped she'd get the chance to share. Like, this guy can't win, right? Downstairs at the West End, policemen stood outside two large ballrooms adorned with gold seven balloons, both so packed with Spamberger supporters that the overflow crowd had to sip their Bud Lights and white wines in the hallway. There was a line to get into the main ballroom where the Rolling Stones' Beast of Burden hummed from speakers, a line at each of the five cash bars, and a line at the buffet, people filling their plates with spring rolls and biscuits. Kids drunk on soda and up past their bedtimes whizzed through the crowd, a 30-something white man in an American flag tie, an older black woman in a felt cowboy hat, a middle-aged woman in an elect women t-shirt, men in turbans who looked like they'd just come from the office, a gray-haired veteran in a Marine Corps hat. There were men holding beer bottles and men holding babies, and men holding both, women hugging and taking selfies. Somewhere was Spamberger's uncle. He's a Trump supporter. He trolls my campaign Facebook page, she said, rolling her eyes. Oh, he's down there proud as a peacock, said Spamberger's mom, an outgoing blonde who'd been active in local, the local political scene long before her daughter ran for office. You should see him. In the front of the room, several members of Spamberger's daughter's Girl Scout troop sat on the stage, which stood empty except for blue and white balloons, a flag, and a podium just waiting for its moment. In the back, members of the media stood on risers under bright lights. There were races being called all across the country, but in this ballroom that smelled like carpet cleaner and sweat and whatever the Weston had missed it in to, to overtake both, a microcosm of the entire election was underway. Abigail Spamberger, a woman with no political experience who was fed up with the status quo in Washington, was, able to, was about to find out if she defeated uh, Representative Dave Bratt, an ardent Trump supporter who dismissed his female constituents when they demanded answers. She was about to find out if she'd done the seemingly impossible. And so was everyone else. It was nearing 10 p.m. I'm fast forwarding a little here because there's another candidate in there. It was nearing 10 p.m. and Spamberger's sister Hillary paced in front of the television. At a quick glance, the two could almost be mistaken for twins. I almost can't go out there because people think I'm her and hug me and get all excited, said Hillary. So instead, she waited with other members of the family in a separate room down the hall from the main crowd, watching the TV and wondering how her sister was doing upstairs on the third floor. As the race continued to look like it could go either way, Hillary's husband rubbed her back to calm her. She kicked off her heels and stood barefoot on the carpet, cupping her glass with both hands and shaking her head. The relaxed mood at the start of the night had given way to tense looks and people frantically staring at their phones. Did you hear anything? Any updates? What's happening now? The scene was startlingly familiar on the third floor of the hotel where Hayworth was reading over the speech he'd written for Spamberger one more time. The two had met four years earlier working at a consulting firm. I was the first person who was nice to her, joked Hayworth, stretching the top of his collared shirt, which was already unbuttoned. In February 2017, when Spamberger first mentioned to him that she was thinking about maybe running for office, Hayworth told her he wanted to work on her campaign. He'd been writing and revising the last speech of her campaign for a month. With some back and forth, Spamberger said, she'd edited it to be less partisan, more inclusive, but she hadn't practiced it. What if we lose, Max, she said. Her tone suggested she didn't really believe that would happen, 
But it was the first time in a year and a half that I'd heard her even mention defeat. How are we going to change the speech? Hayworth shook his head and waved his hand. I've got it covered, he said. Covered how, said Spamberger. I wrote a concession speech, said Hayworth. You did, said Spamberger. She looked both surprised and amused. I'm planning on it dying with me, Hayworth quickly followed up. You will never read it. Spamberger paused, looked up at the ceiling, and then back at Hayworth. If she lost, I might just go off the cuff, she said. Just then, Adam walked back into the room. He'd spoken with Dana Bai, Spamberger's campaign manager, who was on the phone in the next room going over the logistics of a potential recount. You want it raw, said Adam, leaning up against the wooden media console. Spamberger nodded. You're up by 0.57% or something, he said. It's looking like you're going to end up being up, but as long as it's under 1%, Brat can request a recount. If it's under a half percent, then the state has to pay for it. Adam continued, so what has to happen now, they literally pull the tapes from each of the freaking scanners and they run those numbers again. Spamberger wanted to go downstairs. If she wasn't going to win or lose tonight, then why stay in a hotel room? She had family and friends waiting for her, plus a crowd of supporters and volunteers. Adam shook his head. From a press standpoint, you can't, he said. He was right. There was no way for Spamberger to avoid the media who would want her to comment. As Spamberger accepted that it was going to be a very long evening, her youngest daughter, four-year-old Catherine, entered the room. I need a snuggle, said Spamberger, holding Catherine close. For a moment, they rested in the chair together, Spamberger closing her eyes. In the next room, her two other daughters were still awake in their matching navy blue party dresses with sparkly stars. Nobody was ready to call it a night, but also nobody could leave the floor. Abby, don't look so, so forlorn. Get your blood flowing, said Adam. He reached out his hand to help her out of the chair. After checking to make sure nobody was in the hallway, they walked out of the suite toward their daughter's hotel room, texting their ninth grade babysitter's parents on the way to make sure she could stay out so late. After saying goodnight to the girls, they went back for a walk through the empty hallways, arms around each other's backs, looking like any other couple that might check into the hotel that night. We're just waiting, said Adam, the adrenaline from the day appearing to be wearing off. Spamberger nodded and said they'd put the girls to bed, no sense in them staying up, and she looked ready for some shut-eye herself. Next door, though, Bai was staring at her laptop, a phone pressed against her ear. Her demeanor shifted as she listened to whatever was being said on the other end of the line, nodding furiously and looking at her screen. The staffer who'd been crunching numbers most of the night hunched over her laptop, too. Something was happening. Brad had done well in most of the rural districts, but Spamberger held the more populated suburbs. Not counting absentee ballots, she had the slight lead. If the absentee ballots currently being counted were in her favor, and they were confident they would be, then was it time to call this a win? Adam rushed over to see the numbers himself. Spamberg had thousands of volunteers, many of whom had voted absentee so they could help out on election day. In a district where more than 300,000 people had voted, the race at that point looked like it could come down to less than 2,000 votes. The math was in Spamberger's favor. A few minutes went by, and they added up the numbers again. Still good. Knock, knock. Congressman Donald, Donald McEachin, who'd just been reelected to represent Virginia's fourth district, entered the hotel suite with open arms. Spamberger hugged him back, but she seemed confused when he offered his congratulations. Well, we don't know yet, she said, still waiting for a news organization to declare her the winner. Adam Weiss and Hayworth circled as a representative. McEachin spoke to Spamberger directly. The race was close, he said, but he'd seen the numbers too, and there was no way she was going to lose. It was important to go down there and declare victory, because if not, he feared that Bratz Camp would see an opportunity to spin the results and seize it. Spamberger took the advice. Then she looked at the TV. Still no check, she said. No check. She shifted from one foot to the other, clasping her hands together. No check, no check. Was it real without a check? At 10.47 p.m., Bai walked through the doorway. The congressman thinks I should go out there, and Spamberger blurted out. I think we should do it, said Bai, still holding the phone she'd been talking into for the past hour. Bai was a diligent campaign manager. She'd made the calls, and she'd reviewed the numbers. Without them calling it, announce that we won, said Spamberger. She looked at Adam and raised her eyebrows. Let's do it, he said. The group sprang into action, grabbing suit jackets and phones before heading into the hallway. As campaign staffers began exchanging hugs, Spamberger, always wanting as much data, as much evidence as possible, looked again for reassurance. We're really doing this, she said, surveying the scene around her, members of her team already scrambling for their phones. 
She grabbed a makeup compact and quickly powdered her face. Adam fetched the girls. Once in the hallway, Spamberger took, Spamberger took a selfie with her family and her campaign team, her extended family. That was the moment they'd worked for for over a year. The long hours in her daughter's playroom before they even had a campaign office, talking strategy among teddy bears. Fundraiser after fundraiser, trying to muster up every possible cent in a campaign that ultimately cost more than $5 million. Sleepless nights answering emails, weekends knocking on doors and shaking hands, and the dark moments. The day she found out that a right-wing PAC had mistakenly been given access to her top secret security clearance. Twitter attacks, Facebook attacks, trolls. Two years earlier, she'd spent election night wondering what to tell her girls in the morning when they learned Trump had been elected president. Tonight, she was showing them that when someone wants to squash your voice or take your rights away, you fight back. She was showing them that women's voices mattered, that women can win too. Look at mommy. There's a check, someone said, from back inside the suite. It was NBC. The news was followed by more chatter in the hallway, more hugs. We got a check, Spamberger said, finally re just showing relief and smoothing out her black sheath. OK, OK, we've got a check. For the first time in hours, she no longer appeared on autopilot. She laughed, a happy laugh, a we did it laugh, and looked around. Is this a dream, she whispered to nobody in particular. No, piped a little voice. It was Spamberger's daughter, Catherine. If this were a dream, I'd have a dog. <laughs> By the time Spamberger and her team were escorted down a back stairway and onto a sidewalk near the Weston parking lot, the crowd inside had hit a fever pitch. Abby, 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 they chanted between woos and yas. The music was much louder than earlier, Casey and the Sunshine Band's boogie shoes belting out. By spung Spamberger's oldest daughter, Claire, and members of the team let out a little dance. One of the policemen guarding Spamberger opened the door and let her in through the, the delivery entrance, her energy escalating with each step until she, until she stood behind the stage, listening to Representative McEachin introduce her as the district's next congresswoman, and also its first congresswoman ever. Adam reminded the girls, you're going to stand behind mommy with me. You can be happy, but you need to stay with me. They weren't listening, and really, who could blame them? The chance grew to a full-out howl as Spamberger took the stage, eventually positioning herself behind a podium with an index card taped to it with the message, love, not hate, makes America great, scrawled out in black marker. On the side of the stage, her mom looked on, hands cupped over her mouth, as she watched her daughter's life change with the flash of each camera. Spamberger let it soak in for a moment, and then leaned toward the mic. We did it, she said holding her hand to her chest and her tears welling and tears welling up in her eyes. We won an unwinnable district by doing exactly what every campaign should do, Spamberger said, looking down at the words she and Hayworth had poured over. We focused on the needs of the people, the voters. We talked about the substantive issues affecting their lives. We stood up for American values and we brought respect and decency back to Virginia politics. As she rattled off key issues of her campaign, Catherine inched toward forward to the stage until she stood next to her mom at the podium. As the crowd clapped and cheered, Catherine jumped up and she clapped along with them. We succeeded at the polls tonight because voters rejected the, the politics of hate, the politics of division, and the politics of ideology, said Spamberger. More cheers, more yelling, more jumping. Adam crouched down and attempted to pull Catherine to the back of the stage again. And without missing a beat, Spamberger turned around, gave her the give it to her, give her to me motion any mom would recognize, and picked her up. Women in the crowd raised their hands in the air and yelled in support as Spamberger rested Catherine on her hip and kept right on talking. A woman like them, who could be a mom, a wife, a CIA operative, and a congressperson. A woman like them not trying to fit into a male mold, but embracing the very parts of herself that were so desperately needed in Washington. You heard me say this before, said Spamberger. I'm a woman who grew up in Henrico County, who grew up in this community, who was taught service, hard work, and the commitment to the belief that the American people can be anything, and we will lead the way in this world. I believe it, and tonight we have shown that democracy is alive and well in Virginia, and as your representative, I will work every single day to reward the trust you placed in me. Anyone who had watched the prior month's debate between Spamberger and Brad or seen the viral video of her response to Brad's insistence on comparing her to Representative Nancy Pelosi as if she didn't exist knew what was coming next. She said, Abigail Spamberger is my name. 
At the corner of the stage, a group of Girl Scouts looked on with wide eyes. I thought back to the popular motto among women who had long advocated for filling the political pipeline with other women, for building a bench of lawmakers who actually looked and sounded like half the population that had for too long been told to sit down and shut up and wait their turn. If you see it, you can be it. Across the country, a similar scene was playing out. 102 women were elected to the US House, 89 of them Democrats, and 37 of them first-time candidates, marking the first time in US history that there would be more than 100 women sitting in the lower chamber. 14 women won US Senate seats, and combined with the 10 already in office, the Senate was poised to have more women serving on it than ever before. And in state races across the country, a boost in wins among female candidates would increase the number of women in state legislatures from 1,879 to 2,112, besting the previous record. What's more, Nevada was about to become the first female majority state legislature in the country. The future became instantly brighter. Okay, here we go. All right, you're all still with me, okay. <coughs> so, before we get to some questions, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about, so that was Abigail Spamberger, I'm sure many of you know. Um, the three other women that I followed uh, closely throughout their campaigns represented different things to me. So one is Catalina Cruz. Catalina is, when I first met her, I was a 34-year-old attorney uh, in New York City. She's also a dreamer. She grew up undocumented after coming to this country with her mother from Colombia when she was nine years old. Uh, she recalled to me growing up not just as an immigrant in this country, but also as a low-income immigrant, as seeing her mother uh, clean motel rooms at night. Her mom was sold empanadas on the street, gave out flyers for $40 a day just to put food on the table. And for Catalina, the 2016 election struck an urgency in her, and the rhetoric that was coming out about immigration impacted not only the people she loved, her own mother, um, but also her community. And she is now uh, an assembly member in New York State. There's Anna Escamani, who when I met her as a 27-year-old uh, former Planned Parenthood staffer who had a podium um, in her living room. She was that um, active in her community that she would show up at events and sometimes she said, well, we would get there and there wouldn't always be a place, you know, it would be awkward, someone would just be standing in front of the room. So she bought a podium off of Amazon and kept it in her living room. And then I met her in her, in her, uh, her car. I get in there and it's just, it's, campaign signs and it's Planned Parenthood signs and she's like, well, I have to, I pushed the podium into the back over there. She ended up running um, as a 27 year old woman in a purple district in Florida. She ran a boldly pro-choice and anti-gun campaign and won by a landslide. I also followed London Lamar. London is now the youngest uh, black woman in elected office in all of Tennessee. She is a voice for women of color in a legislative body that is largely white male and conservative. Um, and so that ended up being the journeys of the women that I followed most closely. In this book, I also spoke with uh, numerous experts and researchers about some of the long-standing barriers that we know have kept women off the ballot. So two of the big ones um, are one that no one encourages women to run for office. Men get groomed to run early on. If you look at even student governments on campuses, college campuses across this country, they're largely male. And what this does is it creates a pipeline of men who start to think that they have that political resume and women who don't, and so they take themselves out of it. And that leads to the second point, which is the other thing that came out of all this research and when I was speaking with uh, experts in this field and digging through all the studies, and there's been studies on this for decades, so there's actually a lot to go through, um, is that women don't think they're qualified enough to run. Even women who have experience in education and might be wonderful candidates for their school board, uh, women who maybe haven't run for office before but are incredibly active in their community or on single issues um, and know how to organize around them or who have organized uh, for other candidates before, able to take those skills and see themselves in a different way and say, well, maybe I could apply this to my state legislature. Um, maybe I could run for Congress. It's impossible to tell this story without talking about the 2016 election, which I know people have different opinions about. I think it's important to be transparent in, for anyone who hasn't read this book, I take a point of view in this research. Um, I was interested in women who 
saw the 2016 election, and thought, maybe there's something that I need to be doing about this. It did end up being Democratic women who ran in record numbers. Um, I was curious throughout my reporting. In 2016, I talked to a group called Republican Women for Hillary. And these were women who were lifelong Republicans. And they, when Trump became the nominee, they said to themselves, this isn't, this isn't someone I want representing me. This rhetoric, this sexist rhetoric, this racist rhetoric, this isn't my party. I don't feel this connection. And they actually ended up canvassing for Hillary. And since then, they've organized and formed a group called Republican Women for Progress. Um, and they're doing really good work, and they're continuing that work. But I was really curious, actually, and in my initial outline for this book, I left room for them. I was curious if those women, too, would rise up and run, and it didn't happen. Maybe it will in the future. But this ended up being a book about Democratic women and the surge of Democratic women um, who had the guts to run. So what does it mean to run for office while female um, in the backdrop of our heightened political state right now? So there were certain things that I learned that didn't surprise me and other things that shocked me. I'm going to go with the shocking so we can get to the Q&A part of this. Um, I talked with women about fundraising. And something I was told early on was, well, I would go to these training programs where they were uh, training first-time female candidates on the sort of nuts and bolts of running for office, canvassing, fundraising, things like that. And I was told, just watch when they have to start doing fundraising calls because everyone runs to the bathroom and you're going to see tears and people sort of start sweating because it's this very uncomfortable thing where these women are asked to take their cell phones and really go through all of their contacts. Anyone on your list, so think about this right now, anyone who's on your contact list right now, to call each and every one of those people and to ask them for a specific amount of money. So maybe to call, uh, for some of the women in the room you might think of, and Amy Klobuchar actually has done this. She has raised $17,000 from ex-boyfriends. But imagine calling. <laughs> Hi, we haven't spoken in eight years. I'm running for XYZ office. Would you donate $500 to my campaign? How are you? Hope you're well. Um, and that these women, this, the, that obstacle of having to ask for money is actually something that can be very difficult for women. There are certain gendered behaviors in that. Women are often um, taught, sort of socialized not to ask for things. Certainly not money, right? Impolite, who talks about money, who asks for money. Um, and so that tends to be a barrier that women do need to get past. That we know. So there is some research that has spoken to that before. But what I was shocked to hear about was, for instance, Krish Vignaraja, who ran for governor in Maryland. She didn't win her race. Uh, she was a, uh, she is a woman, uh, she was in her 30s, um, very well connected. She had worked for Michelle Obama uh, in the White House. She would call up high-level female donors, women who she said were on the sort of the Fortune 500 type list, right? So these women who have, uh, certainly have their own means and she said, I can't tell you how shocked I was when I would call and I would give them my pitch and I would tell them why I was running and what I was fighting for. And some of these women would say to her, well, thank you so much for calling, but I need to ask my husband. Also, she called up men in Silicon Valley. Men in Silicon Valley have money, right? Good place to fundraise. We know some of these centers. So she uh, would make those calls as well. And she would get on the phone with some of these donors, men who she knew were donating to various campaigns. She'd done her research. And she would make a case for them, to them. Here's why I'm running. This is what I'm for. But she would also make a case about why we need more women in office. And she said more than once when she had that conversation and she switched tones, that conversation went south. And these men would be offended. They would tell her, I am offended that you would frame this that way. I'm offended that you would bring up gender in this conversation, as if it's not relevant. And it is relevant. So there were some of these surprising conversations um, around fundraising that took place. And also, there's someone like Catalina. So Catalina talked, about, talked to me about, she's in New York City, which is one of also a big fundraising uh, area, especially for Democrats in this country. And I said, well, Catalina, are any of these groups, these women, these grassroots groups of women, wealthy women who are organizing in each other's beautiful Manhattan apartments, have they invited you over? Have you heard from any of them? She was like, who are these women? Do you know them? Can you introduce me to them? Um, and this was, and I had read about them. I didn't know them. But you know, she, had, she was disconnected from this world. And she said, not only am I an immigrant woman, not only that, I not only am I a woman of color, I'm a low-income woman. Who am I asking for for money? 
My friends don't have an extra, they can't max out to my campaign. Some of my friends are on maternity leave. Some of my friends have student loans. And this is something that I would hear, not just from someone like Catalina, but also other young women who were running, whose friends necessarily aren't, they don't have those retirement accounts, or aren't in necessarily the stage of their lives where they've accrued a lot of savings. And this does create sort of barriers for women as they're entering office, but the good news is that women many women overcame these barriers, and the way that they overcome them is with hustle. So you can get a big donation from a large, rich, fancy donor, and that's great, and they want them, if they can get them. But if you can't, you can get a lot of small donations from other people, and those add up over time. And not only that, but really at the end of the day, what you're after is votes and not money. So if someone's invested $10 in your campaign, and that $10, and they felt that $10, that $10 meant that they didn't get to go to a movie that weekend, or they didn't get Starbucks that week, or whatever it was, that person shows up to vote for you. So that was something that I saw in numerous races across the country um, that I thought was really impactful. The last thing I'm going to talk about here before we just I open up to some questions because I'm looking at the clock um, is this uh, I became a mom during the course of reporting this book so I actually gave birth during primary season to my first child and wrote the book with an infant <laughs> um, and uh, Abigail became um, sort of this model for me as I was reporting on her and watching her with these three young kids running for office um, it has been long been very very difficult to get women with children to run and so it creates this gap where we have women, and I think Nancy Pelosi is an example of this, although she's just one. You have an example, you have women who raise their kids and then later on in life they go and they run for office and that's great. And you also have women who are right out of college and who perhaps haven't put down those roots yet and they run for office and that's also great. But there is a whole gap, sometimes you know, a 20 year in some cases gap of women um, who are mid-career, mid-family, that have always been really hard to kind of bring into the fold. And we really saw that starting to change in 2018. So just looking at Congress, for example, so we have, there's Abigail Spamberger, there's also Katie Porter from California, who's a, mo a single mom of three. Um, there were numerous women who ran with children, and they changed the conversation as they ran. So the advice used to be, if you're running for office with kids, you don't really want to bring your kids to campaign events. Maybe a very pretty manicured photo of your whole family and white button downs or whatever on your lawn, but you don't want to necessarily have them out there with you. And the reason for that is that there's research that shows that uh, voters show concerns when women with young children run for office because they tend to distrust their ability to handle the demands of family and also the demands um, of their constituents. Whereas when men with families run for office, people love it, right? It shows loyalty, it shows responsibility, look at his amazing family. And of course, they don't, they don't necessarily assume that it's going to affect his performance in office because they assume his partner is at home uh, taking care of the kids. So this is something women have been up against uh, for decades. And something that really changed is as more women with children ran, they really normalized, uh, they started to normalize at least, um, being out there as their true selves and their authentic selves. And this meant bringing their kids to event, events. So you have Luba Gretchen Shirley, who ran for Congress out on Long Island, whose son broke his femur during the campaign. She was paying a babysitter $22 an hour. She said, this is not sustainable. Women like me cannot run for office uh, if we have to pay this amount of money. I'm already not getting paid. I already quit my job and everything else, and now I have to also pay for childcare. And she successfully petitioned the FEC to allow candidates um, to use campaign funds to pay for childcare. And so that changes things for all these other women who run behind her, and men too, because men with children can also use their campaign funds. We had women breastfeeding in campaign videos uh, to normalize that behavior. We also had, uh, the Me Too movement, of course, was happening in the backdrop of this, and you had numerous candidates, um, inc including Ayanna Presley, um, talking about their own experiences with sexual assault, with sexual harassment, and all the terrible gray areas in between, being open about those experiences publicly. And this shift is really important because the idea of a woman running for office and talking about being uh, having survived some uh, sort of assault or being the victim of something uh, in many years prior would have been considered, you never would have talked about that. That would be seen as perhaps as a weakness. And it was another example, I think, of how the public conversation changed when women all over the country 
were out, there was this outpouring with the Me Too movement where women were sharing their stories. And there was kind of a public catharsis happening and also action in that powerful men in certain positions were actually losing their jobs for these behaviors. And there was actually consequence. And collectively, I think, with women's support behind them, these female candidates were able to not only talk about those experiences and be a part of that conversation, but they were also able to create policy around those experiences. Ana Eskamani, one of the young women that I followed closely for the book, um, she actually gave back donations to two high-level Democrats in Florida who had been ac credibly accused of sexual misconduct and harassment. And not only did she give the donations, well, I shouldn't say she gave them back, she donated them to a victim service center, and then she wrote an email to her whole donor base explaining why. And she said, we have to walk the walk. We can't accept this money and then say one thing and not another. And then not only that, but she also uh, drafted up for her a proposal of how businesses would need to conduct themselves in the state um, and creating protocols for handling harassment. So these are all just sort of examples um, of some of the ways that women are changing a system. Um, and I guess from here, I would just open it up if anyone has any questions. There's a lot more things in the book that I'm not getting to, but. Sure. What do you think is your role of the media in changing people's perceptions on even your book title, CJ Wynn? Yeah. Big one is just changing perceptions of how we view women running for office. What role does the media play? And you see the documentary doing misrepresentation. Hmm. Like, what role does the media play in changing perceptions on whether or not women can win? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I actually have a chapter in the book dedicated to the to the media, the, the media's treatment of women. So there's a couple things I think just baseline that are important here. The vast majority of political reporters in this country are men. Um, two thirds of reporters who hold congressional uh, press passes are men. There's also uh, studies that show, or a study that shows, rather, rather large study, that uh, these male journalists echo each other. If you go on, they call it the echo chamber on Twitter. They retweet each other, they share each other's stories, check out the op-eds, they have a lot of the same angles, um, and they are, in a large way, in that, shaping the public conversation. Something that was really interesting in the 2018 election cycle was that as more women were running, and it became, and I saw this really, because I, st I started reporting before it was this big, big story, and then it, of course, ballooned into this huge thing of all these women running and making it on the ballot. Women's media, so this is, I'm talking about, you know, in New York, and. I know this is being recorded, I normally wouldn't say this, but we, we call it the pink ghetto. So, um, and I've written for a lot of women's magazines. I have nothing, nothing against women's magazines at all. Um, but they're sort of considered, in a lot of ways, like second tier. We've been doing political stories for years, and no one really cares, and they're not taken as seriously in the sense of like, well, there's the Atlantic, and there's Politico, and there's some of these like The Economist, and the serious publications, and then maybe Glamour and Cosmo and Marie Claire and some of these other places might not be considered as serious. Um, and a lot of that's really gendered too, right? When we talk about things that affect women, um, look, we've all read men's magazines. I used to work at a men's magazine, like sports, clothes, all this other stuff, and yet they're not considered silly. And when we talk about women's things, when we talk about beauty and we talk about clothes and everything else, and then that all of a sudden is silly. Um, women's media really shifted the conversation in 2018 because you had now at these organizations, one, a very politically invested audience. So Cindy Levy, who's the former editor-in-chief of Glamour for 16 years, I interviewed her for the book. And she said that for years, they would run these political stories about female candidates nothing would happen. So they would go dead, they would publish them, they'd make a big splashy thing. No one cared, no reader letters, little social engagement. And that changed after 2016. And all of a sudden their readership was really eating up these stories and really invested in it. Female editors now at these publications, you have a whole masthead of women. You have reporters who are women. You have writers who are women. And now you have the biggest, one of the biggest political stories of the year, of really the past decade, is women. And what I found in my own reporting was, I don't think that the women I interviewed, I was in their homes, I was with their kids, I was on the road with them. And I don't know this as a fact, this is my opinion, but the things that we talked about and the way that uh, they opened up to me and let me into their lives and their campaigns, I really can't imagine that had I been a guy with a notepad. It just, 
I think women had an opportunity to highlight other women. And I also think in these female candidates, there are these common shared experiences which all women ha share to a certain extent. Some of it might be the experience of having a kid. It might be being harassed at work. It might be being paid less than someone else. It might be not being able to get birth control. It might be a friend of yours uh, who uh, terminated a pregnancy or whatever these whatever the various experiences are that are specifically female I think that female reporters and editors and writers were able to highlight them and highlight these women who were running in a unique way and it elevated women's media so you had a certain portion of people who were really shocked when all of a sudden they were like wait this Cosmo story is really good or like wait this glamour story like they, they really like they were on the campaign trail with them and they got an exclusive or they did this big thing with Hillary and people were all of a sudden paying attention more um, it is shifting. So media has its own, uh, I'll move on from this after this, but media has its own Me Too problem, um, and it has its own sexism, and uh, we have seen a big shift, I think, at least in New York media, there's been, where a lot of the national publications are based, um, you see a lot more women at the top of the mastheads now. So I think it will be really uh, curious to see how that influences the coverage of 2020. Some of it so far is still, there's still a lot of questions about likability and electability, but I think, uh, I think that'll change. I think women will, will play a role in changing it, too. Yeah. There are more women in college and graduating college than men. Yes. <clears throat> One out of five women in the United States decides not to have a child. Doesn't mean they're not going to be mothers, but not to have a child of their own. The pool seems to be enlarging, enlarging. What's the best advice you can provide to men like Um, well, so one is is to um, not just encourage, but to be active. So, of course, if you if you if there's a woman in your life who you think is interested in running, of course, support her. But if there's a woman in your life who hasn't expressed interest in running and you think she might be good at it, let her know, because you might be the first person to ever say that to her, and it might spark something in her. But the biggest thing really is to get on the ground and to, and to get behind the candidates you believe in. So if it's a female candidate and there's a woman running, whether it's a local office or whether it's a federal office or whatever the level of election, be invested. Being invested could mean different things. If you have the financial means, it's giving money. Campaigns need money. Um, it can be phone banking. Phone banking you can do from your house. It can be knocking doors. Um, it's really important, I think, for female candidates who are running to have male allies. You know, we shouldn't just be women supporting women and men are off doing their own thing, right? That's not how it works. We've all been lining up and voting for male candidates since we were able to vote, and I think men should do the same. Um, but I think really just starting those conversations, if you're talking about just getting in on, if there's women in your life who you think would be good at it, um, tell them. Tell them that. Yeah. In the back. I get asked this sometimes, and I, um, it's not an ambition that I've had, um, and I think right now my skill set is suited for this. I love, I have loved highlighting these women and the work that they're doing, and I've continued to do that after this book came out. I just did a piece on Amy McGrath um, that came out last week, this week, what week is it? This week. Um, and uh, so right now I think my skill set is good here in highlighting those women. Um, We'll see, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you talked about like women supporting women, <coughs> and then before you talked about like when women were giving a like a pitch about like female representation in politics, that like males tended to see that tone as like really negative. And then I just noticed today especially, especially like in my age group I'm in college, is there's this kind of like fight back between like the new wave of feminism of like is it feminist to label yourself as feminist mm -hmm. and should you talk about it and how like I just feel like you walk this now like female candidates walk this really fine line and how did you view female candidates like coping with that and how do you see them coping with it coming into the next election? Yeah that's a really good question. Um, it really depends on a few things. It depends on the district where you're running. So I'll talk about Abigail Spamberger. I mean, she was running in a uh, 
you know, it's what has largely been what had been at the time considered a Republican, a safely Republican district. Um, she was a pro-choice candidate. She was very open about uh, if anyone asked her about her stances on, on certain issues that might be considered feminist issues, she would address those. She wasn't hiding anything. But no, she wasn't running through the street, you know, with a big pink sign or anything like that. I mean, she had to walk that line within her district. I think a thing that did work for the women running in some of these um, more, maybe perhaps more socially conservative districts that has worked well um, is transparency. So I, what I, what I saw was that no matter where they might stand on certain issues, people respond to authenticity. They respond well when you're consistent on your policy positions um, and when you're able to listen. So when you're also able to listen to someone who might oppose your point of view um, without necessarily flip-flopping yourself, but have, being able to have those conversations. Um, and in terms of a larger extent though, in terms, I mean, no, candidates weren't out there necessarily being like feminism or, you know, uh, but they do talk about issues that impact women. And that's what works in elections. At least that's what I saw work. I saw when you go into a district and you listen to people in that district and you talk about jobs and you talk about health care, and health care can be abortion access. Health care can be reproductive rights. It can touch on some of these feminist uh, tent poles. Uh, when you talk about jobs, you're also talking about wages. We have a huge wage gap in this country between men and women, and even more for women of color. So. You incorporate these things into your platform and into your policy, but I think just talking about them um, in a way that maybe you take out some of the jargon and the language or things like that so that more people will listen. We tend to think sometimes people close off if they hear certain words that to them say, well, that's not really me or I don't talk that way. Um, so it's being authentic, it's being transparent, it's being inclusive. Um, women have dominated, I'm forgetting the exact number, so I don't want to say something that's incorrect. What I do know is that women, since I believe the early 1980s, it might even be longer than that, um, have voted in higher numbers than men. In the 2018 midterms, um, it was, at least among, among Democrats, um, well, 50, it's not just among Democrats, 59% of women who voted, voted Democratic. Um, women outvoted men in every subcategory. So women are the voting block. I mean, if you're a block, we're, half the, we're more than half the population, so I don't know if you really want to call it a block, but women are, women really do decide elections in this country and are the majority of voters. Can a woman be president? Are you talking about executive office? So there is a difference between when women run um, for a legislative seat versus an executive seat. So what has been found, um, and there's a study on this, is that when women run to be a part of a state legislator or Congress, they still are subject to a certain level of sexism and misogyny. We, we, we saw that in 2018. We continue to see it. Um, but much less than women who run for executive office. So governorships and then in our very small sample pool presidents, um, they face a much higher level of misogyny. And so what does that tell us? That tells us when women run to be part of something, it's less threatening than when women run to be in charge of something. And so we have to sort of think about where that attitude comes from. I can't stress to me how much it hurts. We have in the Democratic primary right now, we obviously have multiple female candidates. How much it hurts these women 
that no one in this country, none of us in sort of the deep recesses of our brain, we've never seen a woman behind, in, behind the desk in the Oval Office. We've never seen a female president in that position having that role. We've seen many, we've always seen as men. That's all we know. And so I do think there's a bit of this knee-jerk reaction where especially now among Democrats at least who would like to see Trump uh, not reelected, there is a bit of a panic button happening among some voters in this country that I think there's this idea of pulling back to like, well, what's safe and what's, well, maybe that moderate white male is where we should be going. You know, that's what's worked in the past. And that, a lot of that I do think has to do with the fact that that's what we know. When we conjure up those images of a president, of a leader, who do we think of? We've never had a woman in that position. I think it really hurts the female candidates in the race. Um, as far as the question that you know, you're asking about misogyny and does that play a role, um, I think it certainly does. The last interview I did for the book was with Hillary Clinton and uh, we spoke about that specifically. And uh, I asked her if she was hopeful for women running in 2020. Do you, I said, do you think that now they'll face less sexism and less misogyny. She wasn't optimistic, but she said, I sure hope so. Is there a question in the back? Yeah. Yeah, most people that run for office run for some lower office and then a higher office and move up. And they learn how to get out the vote and to get money. <clears throat> I had the feeling, did most of these people start at the top? Is this their first office they were running for? So in 2018, yeah, I know, thank you for your question. Yeah, in 2018, the, uh, the freshman class, so the sort of the famous freshman class of uh, uh, over, over th uh, 30 women who, I think it's 37 women who, um, who won, uh, no, they didn't work their way up. And that's actually also something that's quite gendered. Um, I can't tell you how many women in traveling around this country and going to numerous boot camps and training camps where these female candidates were going, how many women said to me, that when they went forward and said, okay, I want to run, people within their own party, people they knew, said one of two things. Well, why don't you just join the PTA? Or, oh, you want to run for Congress? Mm, well, maybe you should start smaller. Maybe you should start at a state seat. Now look, there can be something for that. And I think to your point, right, having sort of that traditional trajectory where you start small and you get experience and people get to know you, a lot of people do do that. And um, it's a totally great and fine way to run for office. But I think that uh, what we saw was that you can be successful not doing that, that you can take skills from other areas of your life and apply those to a campaign, and that if you do it in the right way, um, it's enough. And we're seeing a lot of these women um, do really well in elected office. So. Um, I do think it's changing a bit, and I will say, actually, I think Trump changed that. I mean, here is a man with no political qualifications to speak of who's sitting in the highest office in the country. Um, and so I do think that it's shifting and that people aren't necessarily climbing that ladder or they don't see that as the only way forward, I think, to run. But when a woman says, I'll have to speak to my, my husband, I think you must understand that. Oh, okay, tell me, why do you think I do? I think she is saying, You've never talked to me about an issue. You've never come and talked to me before about asking me for my vote. The first call you give me is for money. And this is a way of being polite, not to say, I'm not going to give you money when you haven't considered who I am. And so she hides behind, maybe I'll talk to my husband. She doesn't say, no, outright. That's kind of being polite. And she may think later, well, I wish I had thought of a better way of saying that. I'm sorry I said it that way. But it's really a way of saying you haven't earned the right to ask me for money. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate your thoughts on it. Um, in that conversation, so it's very common, especially in a gubernatorial race where fundraising is quite high, it is actually very common for these candidates to call out of state. So these are people who can vote for them. Um, but who, if you're going down, typically in a call time like that, when you're asking for these high level donors, you target people who have donated before to similar campaigns out of state. And so it's not a blind call. Um, and she certainly would talk about issues on the call. Um, but I think that that was something that just surprised her because she knew that these women had their own financial means. And um, I think anticipated that they would make that decision on their own. Um, and so that surprised her. Uh, it certainly surprised me when I was reporting on this. I appreciate your, your thoughts on it. Yeah. Um, so when you were talking about the Silicon Valley uh, executives, yeah. um, and you said that they kind of got defensive about um, <coughs> feminism into it or women's representation, and 
that's something I've seen a lot uh, in my own experience. Like, if you talk about feminism, people immediately take the fact that, like, men are bad, and, you, and that's not even what you're necessarily saying. Yeah. So do you think, well, how much of an effect do you think that, that has on everything going on, like elections, everything like that? And do you think it's important to challenge that, or should is it better for women now to kind of dance around that and make it easier for people to take? Yeah, this is such a good question. Um, so actually, the advice on this really changed. So it used to be Erin Velarde, who runs, who runs Vote Run Lead, it's a nonpartisan group. So they train women on both sides of the aisle who are interested in running for office. And what Erin said to me about this was that the advice used to be that if your opponent says something sexist to you, blatantly sexist, you just let it roll off your back, you rise above it, you don't call attention to it, kind of keep your head down, move forward. That advice has really changed in the past couple years. Now, especially with social media, the advice is if someone blatantly, especially your opponent, if you're blatantly attacks you in a sexist or misogynistic way, to call it out. You can call it out publicly. You can call it out on Twitter. It can actually become viral moments. They can become fundraising moments. And so these conversations are actually really shifting um, as I think more and more uh, women are feeling empowered to speak up, not just in politics, but around the country on a variety of issues, on college campuses, which is great. And uh, as those conversations shift, it actually empowers these candidates to be able to clap back a bit more, too, um, which was you know, kind of cool to see. We do. <laughs> Thank you all so much for um, listening and for being here. I appreciate all of you. Thank you.